In Algebra 1 and Algebra 2, we learned several different ways of solving quadratic equations. There's one you may not have covered that I'm going to mention here in a little bit because it's going to help us when we study conics later on. Quadratic equations are any equation that the biggest exponent of the variable is squared. And it doesn't really matter what letter of the alphabet I use, so I'm going to do this problem. We'll call it p squared minus 6p plus 5 equals 0. And in Algebra 1, you learned how to solve this by factoring. So you would look for the two numbers that multiply to give you 5, but add to give you negative 6, and you should tell me they are, I'm already reverting to x, p minus 5 and p minus 1. So we use the zero product property and find out that p is equal to 5 and p is equal to 1. The other way you may not have learned is when you have any polynomial, but specifically quadratics, as long as the solutions are real, you can graph this on your calculator and look for where it hits the x-axis. You'll notice when I look at the graph of this, it hits the x-axis at 1 and 5. Another way to solve this was the quadratic formula, the opposite of b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. Normally, we don't use the quadratic formula for solving quadratics whose solutions are real or rational. We usually use the quadratic formula to find solutions that are imaginary or irrational. But for the purposes of reviewing the quadratic formula, I'm going to do this easy problem here. So a is 1, because a is always the coefficient in front of the square term when the equation is in ax squared plus bx plus c format. b is negative 6, and c is 5. So x is equal to the opposite of b, plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. The way that I have always taught students to do the quadratic formula was to always evaluate what's under the square root sign first. So do the b squared minus 4ac part first. Negative 6 squared is 36 minus 4 times 1 times 5 is 20. And 36 minus 20 is 16. Over here, those two negatives become a positive. And in the denominator, 2 times 1 is 2. Well, since the square root of 16 is 4, I get 6 plus or minus 4 over 2. So there are two solutions here. One of them is 6 plus 4 divided by 2. And the other one is 6 minus 4 divided by 2. So this is 10 over 2, which is 5. And this is 2 over 2, which is 1. And I found the other two solutions. Another method for solving quadratics, but n not something we generally tend to use to solve quadratics, because it's really not the most convenient way, is called completing the square. Completing the square means creating something called a perfect square trinomial. You've actually seen perfect square trinomials before. Perfect square trinomials are ones where the last term in the trinomial is a perfect square, and the middle term is the sum of the same two numbers that multiply to give you the last term. Some examples are x squared plus 10x plus 25, because this is 5 times 5, and this is 5 plus 5. Or x squared minus 22x plus 121 because this is negative 11 times negative 11, and this is negative 11 plus negative 11. The reason for creating these perfect square trinomials is because they're easy to factor. This first one factors into x plus 5 squared. The reason that happens is because the two factors that multiply to give you 25 and add to give you 10 are 5 and 5, so you get x plus 5, x plus 5. But anything times itself is squared. Same thing in the second trinomial. This would factor into x minus 11, x minus 11, which is the same as x minus 11 squared. 
So now I'm going to come back up to the top here. The way completing the square works is you take the first two terms of the trinomial and then you create a blank because we're going to make our own perfect square trinomial. And then the constant, you're going to move that to the other side of the equal sign. Well, it's positive 5 on the left, which makes it negative 5 on the right. The way equations work is as long as you add or subtract the same number from both sides of the equal sign, you keep your equation balanced. So whatever number we add to the left, we're also going to add it to the right. Otherwise, the equation is completely different. So I want you to think about this. The middle term is negative 3 plus negative 3. So the last term must be negative 3 times negative 3, which is positive 9. Then the left-hand side is going to factor into x minus 3x minus 3, which is x minus 3 squared. And then when I simplify the right-hand side, I get 4. Well, in order to solve this for x, you would square root both sides. So you would get x minus 3 is equal to plus or minus 2. Remember, when you take the square root, you've got to put that plus or minus symbol. So now I get x minus 3 equals 2, or x equals 5. And I get x minus 3 equals negative 2, or x equals 1. We'll come back to this process of completing the square at another time, because what we'll be concerned with is this part. We don't normally use completing the square to solve quadratics. There are two ways to decide how you're going to go about solving a quadratic. One way is to find in the quadratic formula the part that was under the square root sign. The part that's under the square root sign in the quadratic formula, the b squared minus 4ac part, is called the discriminant. discriminant. And if the discriminant is a positive number greater than 0, you're going to get two real solutions. If b squared minus 4ac equals 0, you're actually going to get one real solution. In other words, if you were to graph the quadratic, only the vertex would touch the x-axis. So it looks like there's only one solution. We actually call it a double root. But sometimes the discriminant can be negative. Well, if the discriminant is negative, then you get a negative number under the square root sign which means that the answer is imaginary. So you would get two imaginary solutions. The other way to determine how many solutions you're going to get is to actually just graph the quadratic. If the quadratic hits the x-axis twice, it has two real solutions. If only the vertex touches the x-axis, it has one real solution. But if the parabola never hits the x-axis, it has two imaginary solutions. I'm going to do this using the discriminant. So again, a is 1, b is negative 6, and c is 13. b squared minus 4ac is going to be 36 minus 52, which is uh, negative 16. And since the discriminant is negative, we're going to get two imaginary solutions. The nice thing about having found the discriminant is that now I already know part of the answer to put into the quadratic formula. In other words, I've already done part of the work. So x is equal to the opposite of b plus or minus the square root of negative 16 all over 2a. So this is going to be 6 plus or minus 4i all over 2. So our two solutions are going to be 6 plus 4i over 2 and 6 minus 4i over 2. When you reduce these fractions, you're going to get 3 plus 2i, 3 minus 2i. Hey, look, those two imaginary solutions are complex conjugates. Remember, Whenever you have imaginary solutions to polynomials, they always come in pairs. They always come in complex conjugates. 
Remember that if you're not sure how to solve a quadratic equation, particularly if the answers are imaginary or irrational, you can always use the quadratic formula. Well, let's do one more example because we always want to do an application problem as well. On a cold day, a 12 volt, ca volt car battery has a resistance of 0 0.02 ohms. The power available to start the motor is modeled by the equation P equals 12I minus 0.02I squared, where I is the current in amperes. What current is needed to produce 1600 watts of power to start the motor? Since 1600 watts is the power, we're going to plug in 1600 for P. And then I get this quadratic equation. Anytime you have a quadratic equation that has decimals in it, I'd tell you to probably use the quadratic formula. We just need to make sure that before we do the quadratic formula, our equation equals zero, and we know what a, b, and c are. So first of all, this isn't equal to zero. All I have to do is subtract 1,600. The po this is positive 12i and negative 0.02i squared. It doesn't matter what order the quadratic is written in. A is always in front of the square term, so it's negative 0.02. B is always in front of the linear term. This is called the linear term because the exponent is 1. So B is 12. And C is always the constant. It's negative 1,600. Again, in order to use the quadratic formula, you first have to have an equation equal to 0. And then you need to find A, B, and C, but be careful. A lot of students mistake that A is the first number they see, B is the second, and C is the third. And that's not how it works. So now I'm going to go plug this into the quadratic formula. So I, I just keep using X, except we're really not solving for X. The input in this particular problem is actually I, so I think I should use that. So the input is equal to the opposite of b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. When I go and simplify this problem, I always simplify what's under the radical first. Remember, that's called the discriminant. And we're going to get a really nice number. We're going to get 16. So i is equal to negative 12 plus or minus the square root of 16 over negative 0 0.04. The square root of 16 is 4. Remember the plus or minus means that there are two solutions. So let's set up those two solutions. One of them is going to be negative 12 plus 4 over negative 0 0.04, and the other one's going to be negative 12 minus 4 over negative 0 0.04. So the first one, negative 12 plus 4, is negative 8, and negative 8 divided by negative 0 0.04 is going to be 200 amperes, or amps. And the next one's going to be negative 12 minus 4, which is negative 16, divided by negative 0 0.04, which is going to be positive 400 amps. So if the um, current needed to produce the 1,600 watts of power can either be 400 amps or 200 amps. And that is a review of quadratic equations.